If you're a perspective first home buyer, I think you're currently being ripped off about $80,000. Give me six minutes and I'll explain why the Australian property bubble is set to pop. Even if I get it half right, that's $1,000 a minute I'm saving you. So hear me out. Point is, interest rates, as often said, will rise, number one. Income has fallen, but most importantly, there's no value. Do you think a two bedroom, two up, two down in Stony Batter is worth 300 grand? I don't. And if you look at the market, all the people on, on the tapes earlier on, it's about value. It's about value. There is no value. I'm just going to go to the Australian Bureau of Statistics website. On the top right, you just enter housing and click search. We go down to the first one that comes up, housing finance in 2011. And if you go straight to downloads, we're looking for table 9A, which is housing finance commitments by type of buyer. Just going to open that spreadsheet. And we're just going to go to the third one down, which says first home buyer's average loan size. So if we just scroll down, the data actually starts from July 1991 and goes all the way down to a couple of months ago, which is May 2011. What I'm doing here is just copying that data across into a separate spreadsheet it's on a line graph using these two columns here. And this one here is the average size of the first homeowner's loan on the top axis and then the dates along the bottom. I've done the same thing uh, with that same date range, but this time with the percentage of buyers which were first home buyers during those months and those years. You can see the dates line up so that both graphs are to scale. I'll just color one red and I'm going to paste them into my graphics software. So please keep in mind this is solid ABS data and what I want to do is transpose one graph over the other. Because they're of the same scale, we get a better idea of the relationship between the average size of first home buyer mortgages and the percentage of first home buyer mortgages. About 1990 and 2000 and right the way up to 2011 where the data ends. And what I'm going to do now is try and draw a line through the middle of this curve between 1990 and 2000. This is the average size of the first home buyer's loan in this time. And I'm going to extend that out, extrapolate that up to the best I can um, to 2011 um, and see where we end up. Here the average first homeowner mortgage in the decade leading up to 2000 is relatively constant. Then there's this incredible turbulence here and that's where the prices start to deviate away right up to where we are in 2011 uh, at an average first homeowner mortgage of $280,000 where that trend line um, suggests it should be around $200,000. After 1990, things remained relatively constant until there was this huge spike in 2000 and a lot of turbulence and dramatically numbers of first home buyers dropped off but at the same time the average price of their mortgage was being pushed up away from this trend line and then it resumed some normalcy again like before but at this time it was on a new level and then quite obviously the um, first home owner grant doubling in 2008 and 9. Um, you can see the effect on prices at the top push them up again um, and here we are in 2011. You can see how dramatic the effect was when the first homeowners grant was introduced in 2000 and the percentage of first home buyers in the market jumped from 15% up to 25% within a couple of months. Uh, it went down for a few months after that, I'll explain that a little bit later. But the most interesting thing is from late July 2001, the numbers of first home buyers started to decrease dramatically. But from this time on, the price of the average first home buyer mortgage, the blue line at the top, held its ground, and in fact increased. So less first home buyers with larger mortgages required. Who was this new competition outbidding the first home buyers?
So why might this mean there's a property bubble? Investors got in after 1999 as a result of a policy that let them pay less tax on their capital gain, that is, the increase in price of a property. The market, in my view, has quite obviously been inflated by investor activity. So what happens now, as of August 2011, when, albeit flatly, property prices have decreased for six consecutive months? What happens with the very real possibility of a capital gain becoming a loss? Owner-occupiers buy a property for the purpose to live in and will write out a loss. Investors, however, mainly buy a property for capital gain. If you have time to watch the next video, I explain in a bit more detail my interpretation of these two graphs and why the property bubble is set to pop.